I am uh, Congressman Jared Huffman. It is a great honor to be with you uh, back in my district, back in my hometown uh, for this town hall meeting. And we're going to get started with a presentation of the colors and a playing of the national anthem. So I hope you'll please join me in standing while our Cub Scout Pack 76 presents the colors. Hi, are you going to be talking? So the mic is on, okay? So if you talk, it'll be I think I said national anthem, but instead we're going to get the Pledge of Allegiance. That was my mistake. Attention. Color Guard Advance. Scout Salute. If you're not in full uniform, please put your right hand over your heart. Color Guard Holt. Color Guard Cross the Colors. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two, color guard post the colors. Color guard dismissed. All right, let's thank our Scout Pack 76. We appreciate that very much. Good job, thank you um, so much. I want to talk a little bit about how this town hall meeting uh, is going to go, or how I hope it'll go. Um, first of all, uh, I will spend just a little bit of time telling you about the work I've been up to uh, in Congress. I won't go on too long, because I want most of this to be a conversation driven by your questions and comments. Uh, but I will start us off. My staff will then circulate with uh, some wireless mics, and so if you have a question or a comment, raise your hand, and my team will do their very best to cover uh, different parts of the room. They'll try to keep moving it around. A um, couple of ground rules, rules I hope you will honor. We try to be respectful of each other uh, and different political points of view. I hope there's a diversity of opinion and politics in this conversation. And uh, if you share my concern that the tone of our politics at the national level is, is too bitter and too toxic, uh, we can do our part right here in this community by having a more civil and respectful conversation. Uh, we can also respect each other by trying to keep the comments or questions brief. Uh, I think you ought to be able to state a comment or a question in about a minute. So I'd, I would ask you to try to do that. And uh, one way I found that's really effective to keep people moving along is if people go much further than a minute, we can kind of quietly start to applaud and encourage them like they do at the, <laughs> like the music at the Academy Awards. Uh, it has a wonderful effect. Uh, one more thing, uh, we're going to try to cover as much ground as possible. And out of respect for everyone who's come here with something to say or a question to ask, I hope we won't um, ask the same question over and over again. There are probably some folks here that are very passionate about one issue or another, but if, if something's already been said or already been asked, I hope you'll respect your neighbors and fellow community members by letting us move on to other subjects so we can uh, get everybody uh, included in this process. Uh, last little piece of housekeeping. Uh, a critical way to keep things moving we have found is that when you uh, talk into the microphone, let my staff hold the microphone. Uh, we found that things really go off the rails when we lose control of those microphones. So uh, just uh, it may feel a little awkward, but it really is better for all of us if, if you let the staff hold on to the microphones. Um, I want to recognize some local elected officials who have honored us with their presence. I'm certainly honored 
to work with all of them. I know County Supervisor Kate Sears is here. Thank you, Supervisor. There she is. From the Court of Madera City Council, uh, David Kunhart is here. From uh, the Miller Creek School Board, uh, Board of Trustees, Brad Hansberger. Where's Brad? I love the sound of that new district name as well, Brad. And uh, Micah Lawrence from the uh, San Rafael School Board. So thanks so much, Micah. Great, now, um, a little bit about what I have been up to. As your representative in Congress, obviously I'm working on all the big issues of the day that you're hearing about and seeing on television, from the fact that uh, something rather historic is happening right now as we speak. In fact, I, I believe opening arguments from the House managers are getting wrapped up uh, on the floor of the United States Senate in the third trial of a president before the Senate following an impeachment vote in the entire history of our country. So that's big and it's historic. Obviously, I've been working on that and other aspects of uh, presidential accountability uh, in recent months. Uh, I am working on the big issues of war and peace that many of you uh, have been so concerned with, uh, including a couple weeks ago when it looked like uh, a very controversial action by President Trump had taken us to the brink of what I would view as a wrong-headed war in the Middle East. Uh, thankfully, uh, it didn't unfold at that level, at least hasn't yet, but I'm still very concerned about reclaiming Congress's authority to put some checks and balances on presidential uh, war making. And we can talk a little more about that, I'm sure, in response to some of your questions and concerns. And then uh, I continue to work on lots of big policy issues, including climate change. I'm on the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. We are wrapping up our work. We've had uh, about 100 meetings and hearings over the course of the last 12 months. And uh, by early April, we will roll out a legislative blueprint that we hope will be responsive to the climate crisis and paint the way for uh, probably uh, the next Congress and the next president to uh, take some bold actions to uh, decarbonize the economy and help save the planet. Now, in addition to all of these big, huge national issues, I'm always looking to make a difference on the local level. And so, you know, right here in Marin, for example, uh, I am fighting to try to get the Corps of Engineers to dredge the San Rafael Canal. And uh, there's probably a few people here that care about that. I know some, some members of the San Rafael Yacht Club in the front row uh, in particular. Uh, we were able, working with the County of Marin and with uh, CLAM, a local uh, nonprofit affordable housing group, to set aside some Coast Guard housing in Point Reyes Station uh, for affordable workforce housing, and that project is now moving forward. And, uh, you know, just continuing a, a, an example of local issues that I'm constantly working on, uh, I've got a lot of fire victims in, in my district. And right now, there is a victim's settlement fund that's been created in the PG&E bankruptcy. I'm trying to make sure that FEMA, which has decided that it now needs to seek reimbursement for some of its disaster relief, doesn't go in and take away funds that are desperately needed to compensate victims. My view is victims get their compensation first, and FEMA can get in line with other creditors and settle up with PG&E uh, after the victims are paid for. So uh, constantly working on trying to take care of district <laughs> needs. Uh, and I'll just uh, mention one more thing before we get to your questions. There may be this perception that because of impeachment, and, and it's, it's all you hear about, it's all you read about, um, that nothing else is happening in the Congress. And, and I do want you to know that this first year of the new Democratic majority that I've gotten to be part of has been one of the more productive years in many, many years in Congress. Uh, we have been able to pass legislation on all of the key priority areas that we promised we would uh, in the 2018 election. There's one exception to that. Infrastructure was supposed to be one of our deliverables. We have not yet passed an infrastructure bill, but I'm on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and I'm happy to report that in the next couple weeks, we are going to be rolling out a big multi-trillion dollar national infrastructure package. We're going to move that forward. I hope we can get it done working with the Senate. But we have checked a lot of other boxes on policy priorities that people may not have heard about. We passed uh, right out the gates H.R. 1, which included voting rights protection, which included election security, 
ethics reform, uh, try to reduce the influence of big money in politics, which is, you know, with the 10th anniversary of Citizens United this week, so uh, we're thinking a lot about that lately. Uh, we passed just uh, last month a really important flagship prescription drug pricing reform bill that'll make a huge difference for lots and lots of Americans in terms of their health care costs. We have passed bills to protect the dreamers from deportation. We've passed legislation to uh, codify equality as a civil rights for everyone, regardless of their sexual orientation or their place on the LGBTQ spectrum. Uh, we have tackled issues as difficult and controversial in recent history as gun violence and actually passed a universal background check bill. All of these bills that we've passed, hundreds of them, including almost 300 with bipartisan support, you know where they are? They're, uh, they're sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk. And so we need to create much more pressure on Mitch McConnell to start bringing these things to the floor of the Senate for a vote. Many of them are broadly popular. As I said, hundreds of them have bipartisan support. And we need to deliver these things for the American people. So uh, with that, I would like to dive into your questions. And I want to start, if I could, um, by creating an exception to this little one minute thing that I'm going to ask of everyone else. Our first question is going to come from uh, Ernie Bergman here in the front row. He's with Vietnam Veterans uh, for America. And uh, at this time when issues of war and peace, I think, are such an important part uh, of our national conversation, I wanted to give Ernie a little extra time in the honor of the first question to get our conversation started. Welcome, Ernie. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me here to speak. Um, I have certain issues that are real important to me, but I need to give a little history about where I come from, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, again, my name is Ernie Bergman. I live here in San Rafael. I was born in San Francisco. My family moved to Mill Valley when I was one year old, so I basically lived my entire life in Marin County. I uh, went through all the stuff that kids do when they grow up in Marin. I was in Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, Explorer Scouts. I did Little League, got an IJ paper route. And uh, just as I was reaching up, getting close to graduating from Town Pius High School, I had to start making decisions about whether I go in the service or not. Now, I had an opportunity to go to college, but I was sick of school. My parents were driving me nuts. I was bored to death, and I decided I would enlist in the United States Navy. Now, I didn't enlist to go to war, because that was right when the Vietnam War was starting to really ramp up. Didn't even, click, uh, didn't even hit my mind. I enlisted because I was looking for the next big adventure. Plus the fact that my, my generation, who was all born in the, in the late 40s, early 50s, we, we, expect, we were expected to go. Our parents all served in World War II. Uh, it was part of the deal. For a guy who was six, or 18 years old in 1966, fact is, it was just expected. It wasn't if, it was when. So I enlisted in the Navy. Went to boot camp in San Diego. Uh, was able to qualify for an A school. And what that is, is it's a school that teaches you the basics of whatever your job is supposed to be when you finally get out in the fleet. I was a service ship navigator. I shot the stars and do all that. And then after my A school, I got orders to go to Vietnam. Um, of my 45-month enlistment, uh, I was uh, deployed by 32 months out of the 42 months. In about 20 of those uh, 32 months, I was in Vietnam. So uh, I kind of served in a kind of an unusual uh, schedule, but that's how it worked out. I left the States, Travis Air Force Base, on February 15, 1967. I flew to Angelo City and then went to Civic Bay. My unit at the time was engaged with the NBA, the North Vietnamese Army, so I was held up in the Philippines for 45 days. Finally, April 3rd, 1967, I got orders to go to Vietnam. And I was nervous, but I was excited. I had no idea what to expect. I had absolutely no combat experience. I didn't know what war was. I was just a kid from Mill Valley that was trying to fulfill his obligation. I arrived in Da Nang on April 4th, 1967. I hope I don't screw this up. Uh, my very first day in Vietnam, I was in transit. I was a very low rank. I was an E2, if any of you know what that is. And I get assigned a work party. I'm at a place called Camp Tian Sha, and I jump on a truck, and they deliver me for this work party at the Da Nang Hospital Triage Center. Now, if those of you don't know what a triage center is, something they have in all type of operations, military or civilian. And where it is, when you have casualties come in, basically the medical staff goes over all the casualties, and they basically identify who is in worse shape, who can, who can wait a little bit. And in the military, and especially during the Vietnam War, what they would do is find the worst guys, 
who they knew could not survive. They called them expectants. And what they would do is that they knew they couldn't survive and that they'd better spend time on other guys. What they would do is shoot them full of morphine, put them on a stretcher, put them in a corner, and allow them to die. That's how it worked. Then they would find the guys that maybe badly hurt, but they thought they could save them. And so they would take those guys right into the operating room right away. Then they would find the guys that might be got a scratch or maybe a bullet wound, but weren't they really that bad? They didn't have to go right in. My job was to be a stretcher bearer, barrier for the treehouse center. So I was pulling guys out of helicopters. I was taking them out of open-sided ambulances. Um, and again, I had no clue what war was. And during that day, April 4th, my very first day in Vietnam, I saw lines of stretchers along the side of the wall full of Marines who were typically laying in their pool of their own blood. And they were either dead or they were dying or they were trying to die. I saw, I saw other Marines, kids, who were really torn up, had shattered arms, had shattered legs. In some cases, they had no legs whatsoever. I saw horrific wounds. Uh, by the end of the day, I had blood all over my uniform, blood all up my arms. And I especially remember this one kid who came in a little bit later and I, I took him out of the side ambulance and took him over, and the first thing I noticed was he had pock marks from, from toe to head. I mean, every square inch of his body had a hole, had, a, had an injury. And I figured the only thing I could think of was he must have gotten on the wrong side of a claymore, and they detonated, and this guy was messed up. I had him about halfway to where the doctors were, and all of a sudden he started shaking. It scared the hell out of me. And so I set him down, and I called the doctor over. And I said, hey, doc, there's something wrong with this guy. And I was looking right at his face, right in his eyes, and he died right there. Now, all the images that I had from that day, April 4th, 1967, 53 years later, I'm 71 right now, that it's still as vivid and as clear as it were April 4th, 1967. Now, that, plus subsequent uh, incidences, because I still had another 32 months to go overseas, that and other incidents of me being involved in combat convinced me that anybody who has experienced the war and has experienced combat couldn't be pro-war, could not be. It is too tragic, it's too immoral, it's too destructive, it's just probably one of the worst experiences I've ever had. Now, I don't mind standing up for your country. Um, I enlisted. Given the right circumstances, I would enlist again, even at my old, in, in, you know, crippled age. But the fact is, is that it would have to be the, the right thing to do. Um, my issue is, right now, we have somebody living in the White House who thinks that war is an attractive alternative. You know, I say that if, you, if, if there's going to be a possibility of war, it has to be the last alternative, the last option. Absolutely avoid it like the plague. But I'm very concerned that we have somebody living in the White House that doesn't feel that way, and it drives me absolutely crazy. So I'd like how you feel about Thank that. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, um, Uh, thank you for your service, for your courage, for your eloquence. Uh, we're, we're grateful to have you here, and, I, and I'm glad you shared your story with us to get us started. Let me just say in response to your concerns, which I, I think are shared by many of the folks that I represent, um, they, they say the first casualty of war is the truth. And uh, I'm afraid that that's absolutely been the case when it comes to uh, this current uh, drama with, with Iran. Uh, with respect to President Trump's very unusual targeting of a top Iranian official, General Soleimani, uh, and, and killing of him, um, we were given bad information. We were lied to uh, about that decision. We were told that there was uh, ironclad intelligence showing an imminent threat that would lead to the death of Americans. The president then went on TV, said it involved four of our embassies. Let me tell you, folks, I've been in the classified briefings. I can't tell you everything that's said in those classified settings, but I can tell you 
w the intelligence was shared with us, we did not see any intelligence that came anywhere close to supporting that story. It just doesn't exist. We were lied to. And we continue to be lied to, because you may know that uh, because of what the president did, Iran had a retaliatory airstrike uh, with some ICBMs that hit a couple of bases uh, in Iraq where American troops were stationed. And we were immediately told nobody was hurt. That's not true. Now we come to learn that at least a dozen of our soldiers were shipped out of country to Lange Dual Air Force Base in Germany. I have been to Lange Dual Air Force Base a couple of times now. This is a, this is a very uh, state-of-the-art trauma center for the most serious injuries that our uh, overseas uh, service members sustain. You don't go there for headaches, uh, as the president would like us to believe. So uh, we're definitely not getting the straight scoop uh, on what happened to take us to the brink of this war, uh, what has happened with our troops so far, and what the plan is. The truth is I don't think there really is a plan uh, for how we're going to keep this from escalating into further conflict in the region and having you know, set off perhaps a new uh, regional nuclear arms race. Uh, because in the period of just a few days, uh, we not only probably got ourselves uh, on the road to being evicted from Iraq, uh, not only uh, enhanced Iran's strategic posture in the region, which was supposed to be what we were there to push back on, not only had to shut down our counter-ISIS initiatives uh, because we were in retreat from all the backlash we were creating, um, but uh, we, we now have this crisis of confidence uh, in this administration because they've been lying to us about all of these matters, uh, and we may well be on our way to uh, a nuclear arms race between Iran and Saudi Arabia, principally in the Middle East, uh, which should be everyone's nightmare. So none of this is good. Uh, I, I'm going to keep pressing for limits on this president's authority, and that starts with the War Powers Administration, uh, the WPA. We've already voted on, under the War Powers Act, rather, to um, prevent any further escalation of this. Uh, this next week, when I go back to Washington, we're going to continue voting. We're going to vote to repeal the 2002 uh, AUMF that the administration has used as a possible basis of authority to go to war with Iran. Uh, this, of course, was the authorization to go to war against Saddam Hussein in Iraq. It never uh, in good faith could be um, interpreted to justify a war with Iran, but the administration has hinted that it may read it that way. We're going to try to make it clear that they can't do that with a vote this week. Uh, and then we'll also uh, pass a Rokana bill that you may have heard about to very specifically uh, make it clear there's no authorization to go to war with Iran. So stay tuned. I share your concern about folks who don't understand the brutal reality of war. We don't want to be involved in any more wars in the Middle East, and I'm doing what I can to make sure that doesn't happen. Okay, the first question's over here, but before he starts, if you have an empty seat next to you, would you raise your hand? Because we want to make sure that every, every seat's filled. Do we have one right? There's one seat here if somebody wants to take it next to this gentleman. Okay, here we go. 70% yeah. of adults in your district support a revenue-neutral carbon tax, so why why do we have to have dozens of laws, dozens of climate solutions, leading to dozens of court cases and years of delay, when a simple, rapidly rising every year, and if it goes up every year, it will be effective. People are not going to pay $8 a gallon for gas. And socially just, because we have people who are in need, you know, a revenue neutral uh, carbon tax, but the money goes back. Why not have that um, on, on fossil fuel companies when that's really more efficient? So I, I support uh, a carbon tax, a carbon fee, uh, various other fees, the, the possibility of a, a cap and trade system that would be a form of uh, carbon pricing. Any kind of carbon pricing has to be included uh, in the suite of solutions that we need to address the climate crisis. I agree with that. Um, there are some different ideas about how to do it. And I, I mentioned that the, the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis will be rolling out a legislative blueprint, a big report, uh, first week of April. I would not expect that report to pick the specific carbon pricing model or much less to flesh out the details of you know, how it ought to be ramped up and, and uh, uh, otherwise implemented. But it will uh, make it very clear that carbon pricing has to be part of our legislative response. And uh, I'm doing everything I can. You, the, the short answer, you said 70% of my constituents support this. Why isn't it happening? Because uh, my constituents uh, 
do not necessarily reflect uh, politics in Washington and the rest of the country right now, but we're doing what we can uh, to move the needle. And uh, I am encouraged that um, once we get past this administration and its attempts to take us backward on the issue of climate change, uh, we may have an opportunity to rejoin the rest of the world having carbon pricing, uh, among other solutions, as part of our response is essential. Over here. Uh, Congressman, uh, first, before I say anything, I just want to say that Ernie's um, story and recounting was very, very moving to me. Uh, and even though I didn't have any bone spurs, I did not experience what you experienced, sir. And it, it, I, I wish that more people uh, understood that who are, sit, who are uh, in D.C. Uh, but I want to follow up on Richard's comment a little bit, uh, be, particularly because there are 75 co-sponsors uh, in the House, okay. and, and there is the another. Yeah. There is a uh, Senate uh, companion bill which our own Senator Dianne Feinstein is supporting, which is very, very similar, and that's supported by 3,550 uh, economists with, whose joint opinion we cannot. Uh, uh, discard any more than we can discard the opinion of the uh, scientific community. It really is a powerful tool to tax the problem. Let's let's dive in. I don't want to spend the whole town hall talking about this, but um, a specific bill uh, is what David is asking about. It does uh, put forward a carbon fee and dividend. Uh, very well-conceived carbon fee. I like a lot of what I see in that bill, and the Citizens Climate Lobby, which you're part of, has done a great job advocating for that bill. And I have uh, tried to explain on various occasions why I'm not co-sponsoring the bill. It's not because I don't like the fee. I like carbon pricing. I like it a lot. Um, I do have some differences with the idea of a universal dividend that goes out to everybody. I think the revenues from carbon pricing are going to need, at least in part, to get reinvested in clean energy and other things and not just farmed back out uh, to people by way of a general dividend. So I, I have some philosophical or tactical differences about that part of the bill. The big difference is that in return for putting this carbon fee in place, the bill calls for a 10-year freeze on EPA regulations of stationary source uh, air pollution. I can't agree to that. And I think it's a mistake, actually, because I think uh, I don't think we have time to bet everything on uh, market mechanisms and wait 10 years to see how it works. Uh, we have about 10 years to decarbonize the economy, as I understand it from the IPCC report. So we're going to need to do both. We're going to need to carbon price, and we're going to need to regulate, and we're going to need to do a whole bunch of other stuff. Very well-intended bill, terrific advocacy group, CCL, uh, but you know that I have honest uh, principal differences on the mechanics of how we get there. Okay, over here. Yes, sir. Uh, my question regards uh, the VA, and I share my brother Ernie's uh, uh, concerns for war. Uh, I, too, served in Vietnam, 68 to 69. Last year, the Mission Act took over the CHOICE program. Yep. Are you aware of the problems that the VA has caused with the mission program? And oh, the... am I? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me happy. I've got a little note I'd like to give yeah. to you regarding that. And also the way the VA treats veterans in terms of their service-connected conditions. Yeah. That rather than treat the condition, they treat a symptom. Veterans go for years with symptoms, dying from a condition. And I think that the VA needs to change its focus. And the, the, the impact on the community of the Mission Act has really caused a lot of problems for acupuncturists, yeah. therapists. And chiropractic, yeah. Yeah, they're all suffering. They're getting these idiotic short-term authorizations, and, and the VA is not talking to them, not, yeah. not responding. They're not even responding to Tri West. So I'd like to know what your office is doing okay. to help us solve that problem for the veterans. Well, thank you, uh, first, for your service, you and Ernie and all the other veterans here, uh, and thanks for your question. Just this week, I sat down in, in Santa Rosa and met with a, a group of local uh, veterans advocates to hear about this specifically. Um, the bill that was just referred to, the Mission Act, uh, was meant to supplement, to be additive to the, the core VA services that our veterans come to count on, uh, meaning that if there was something that um, couldn't be taken care of in the main VA, uh, we would create this Veterans Choice Program where we could 
find them a specialist out there in the community outside of the VA and quickly get them quality care. That was the idea. Um, the problem is, uh, and this begins to get into the whole privatization push, frankly, within this administration in particular, uh, they have left thousands, tens of thousands of provider positions within the VA unfilled. There are just a huge number of vacancies. And what that means is uh, we're sort of hollowing out the main VA, and it seems to me that the agenda is really to push out core functions of the VA into the private sector, which is a backdoor way to privatize the VA, and I oppose that. Uh, the VA is incredibly specialized and good at serving our veteran community. The bureaucracy is a nightmare. And getting them in the door and through the bureaucracy to that service can be really frustrating. I constantly work with veterans to try to troubleshoot that part of it, but the care is great once they get there. Uh, and what I can't do is support a hollowing out uh, of that critical care delivery uh, in the name of privatization. So that's a long answer. Uh, I'm doing everything I can to try to address what's going on. Uh, I will keep working with veterans on an individual basis. On the, you're talking about pain, chronic pain management. Uh, if they're getting jerked around and being forced to restart their qualification for acupuncture, chiropractic, et cetera, my office is really good at speeding that up and helping them with casework. So I hope you'll send veterans our way and we'll do our best to help them. Thank you, Congressman, over here. Hi, my name is Yavar Amidi and I'm representing ICE out of Marin. I want to thank you for your commitment to protecting the human rights of immigrants and fighting... Is that right? Can you hear me now? Yes. I want to thank you for your commitment to protecting the human rights of immigrants and fighting for immigrant justice in Washington. Here, our county has not yet passed a sanctuary county ordinance. And today, the Marin County Sheriff's Office actively disregards the California Values Act and maintains cooperation with ICE against the wishes of the community. The fear these policies create in our communities results in whole populations that do not feel safe contacting the authorities, they can't use services and resources that are available to them, and the community is relegated to second-class citizenship that leaves them forced into the shadows and vulnerable to harm. This collective punishment of innocent families and workers in our county is a glaring injustice. I want to ask you, Congressman, will you endorse our effort to make Marin County a sanctuary for our immigrant communities through a sanctuary county ordinance? And do you support us in our effort to put an end to the Marin County Sheriff's Office's cooperation with ICE and end the devastating effect these policies have? Well, thank you. Thank you for the question. Let me tell you what I'm doing. First of all, at the national level, I'm pushing back in every way I can on what I regard as uh, divisive, hateful, inhumane practices and policies by this administration that uh, vilify and demagogue the immigrant community and that are forcing hundreds, thousands even of people uh, to wait outside this country while they seek to make an asylum claim. We've never done some of these things before. Uh, we're a better country than that, the child separation, all of these things we've seen. So uh, count on my continued opposition to all of those policies and practices at the national level. I would like to see us quickly uh, get to the point of comprehensive immigration reform where we don't have to worry about this tension between national and state and local views on how immigration laws should be enforced. In the meantime, uh, I certainly think that um, the immigrant community should not have to live in fear of any state or local government, and I support sanctuary policies. Okay, back here. Congressman Huffman, um, considering your commitment to tackling the climate crisis, I'm very concerned um, that agribusiness interests in your district are being prioritized over the protection of the native tule elk at Point Reyes National Seashore. Um, there are plans to kill these tule elk. Considering that animal agriculture is widely acknowledged, the number one contributor to the climate crisis, what, why do you favor growing agricultural interests within the seashore, even though the ranches were supposed to be phased out? Thank you. Um, all right. So I'm, I'm going to uh, speak to what I think is the thrust of your question. There's a lot of individual assertions in there that we could unpack. Uh, animal agriculture is not the number one contributor to the climate crisis right now. Uh, Okay, 
Uh, it is a contributor, I'll admit that, and uh, we're going to need to address food systems and all of these things. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested in doing that. Uh, but there are a few, there are a lot of facts that would need to be checked uh, that are packaged up in that question. Let me just say this. I think there are people here that care a lot about our Thule elk, Thule elk population in the Point Reyes National Seashore. Um, I uh, am a big fan of the Thule elk. Just this weekend, I had my family out at Pierce Point. We were taking a hike and enjoying the Thule elk as we often do. I really do go and use the Point Reyes National Seashore. I love it, like probably most people in this room. But it's really important to understand that what makes Point Reyes so unique is that it's not like you know, any other park in some ways. There are parks for all purposes. There are parks that are meant to protect battlefields and amazing views and wilderness areas. Uh, Point Reyes is, is this really interesting mix of many things. Some of it is the wilderness areas that are so spectacular, the wildlife, great recreation opportunities in the Point Reyes National Seashore. But one of the things that got the whole thing rolling back in the late 50s and early 1960s to protect this place was to preserve the agricultural heritage of West Marin, these historic ranches and dairies, this pastoral. I, I, these are facts. These are just facts. They're just facts. Um, so look, uh, the way it was conceived by Congress, and I've heard the statement that Congress wanted the ranches out in 20, that's, look folks, you're entitled to your opinion, but not your own facts. That's just not true. I've read the statutes. I've read the legislative reports that went along with these statutes. I've gone pretty deep into this, including the most recent, recent statements of Congress, which have continued. Uh, it, it is not a situation where Congress said you got to be out in 20 years or anything remotely close to that. Congress created a pastoral zone as one part of this unique mosaic that is the Point Reyes National Seashore. Now, we may come to some point in the future where we no longer have animal agriculture, where we decide we no longer want to preserve that part of the story of the Point Reyes National Seashore, but we're not there right now. And the Park Service, I think, is doing a pretty good job of trying to protect our wonderful elk herds, which are growing. Uh, the, the, we're actually embracing a new elk herd. We're embracing a third new elk herd because we've got this wonderful problem that our elk are thriving. It's great. Uh, but we don't have to choose between healthy elk herds and giving longer term permits to the historic ranches and dairies. We can have both, and I think most of my constituents want us to have both. Congressman in the back. <laughs> there is a... Go ahead, Amy. We're going to... There We're going to reclaim our time here. Keep going. There is. Keep going. Okay. There is a proposition right for the 2020 November. Sir, please respect the other members of the community that are trying to ask questions. This is about the school. I really, I really don't want to have to ask. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. Let's go back to the person who waited patiently to ask her question. Yeah, please. Go right ahead. Okay, here we go again. Hello? Uh, there we go. Keep so keep going. We'll we'll get through this together. Is, there is a proposition for the November 2020. And it's about the commercial property assessment. Now, these properties, which are like Exxon, the commercial properties, there's 8% of them. And they have not had an update assessment since 1978. My question is, why can Jarvis Tax Group send letters to all the California households saying that their houses are the ones that will have their taxes raised. And they, with false negative uh, news, instead of saying that the Exxon Chevron 
is the ones that will be needing the assessment. Okay. Th I thank you. That's I think the I know schools and communities first prop. Great. Thanks for the question. Thanks for your patience working through our little civil action here. Um, I appreciate that. Um, I, th I think uh, what you're saying is that there's an initiative that would address what's called the split role, uh, which is the, the way commercial properties have not been reassessed under Prop 13. It's a, it's a function of state law. It's a function of the state initiative process. And as your representative in Congress, I'm, I'm really not uh, often working on those things. I have an opinion as a citizen. I've always thought that uh, that made no sense, that commercial properties ought to be subject to the same reassessment as residential properties so that they would pay their fair share of taxes. So I'll look at the details of that initiative. If it's what I think it is, I, I might be likely to support it. I've often, often supported uh, fixing that split role issue back when I was a state legislator. But this is just Citizen Huffman speaking to you and not Congressman Huffman. OK, right here. I guess I don't have to stand up. <laughs> At any rate, uh, first of all, uh, uh, Congressman Huffman, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to see you again. You. I'm sure you probably remember uh, sometime around the 5th of September uh, 2019, I had a meeting at your office, San Rafael, uh, with uh, Jenny, also there. And we discussed uh, circumstances regarding the climate and the, uh, the way that we have to stop the global warming and the way we could put together for a carbon neutral fuel, which would deplace the carbon positive fuels of the fossil fuel industry. Uh, specifically, I'm talking about the liquid fuels, gasoline, uh, diesel, and jet fuel. So myself and my associates have made considerably good advancements since I had that meeting with Was you. Was this the direct air capture technology? Yes. You were t this, I remember. This, yeah. Yes, this yeah. is. Yeah, I am, I'm uh, the founder of Solar Air Tech. Yeah. Uh, and uh, as I say, myself and other associates of mine in business, mm -hmm. other businesses, and also universities, have made good advancements in how to do this capture of the carbon dioxide, to strip it out of the atmosphere, and to turn it into a full cycle carbon neutral fuel. We're doing this out of our own pocket, pretty much. And we do have some investors that come in, but it doesn't matter what size they are. It's, it, no one's big enough to, to take hold of this monster. So my question to you is, and I know you're working diligently on this along with other people uh, in Congress and other portions of the government. Do you feel that the United States government, in my opinion, the only government in the world that's large enough, can actually put the money together so that we can save the environment before it collapses? Well, I appreciate the question, and it, it's something that all of us need to think about um, because you know, even if we do all of these other things that we know we have to do with the electricity sector, with the transportation sector, the science is telling us we've, we've got to go negative on carbon emissions sometime around mid-century, and most of the uh, analysis I've seen says that will require things that we haven't yet invented. Uh, so I am so glad that smart people like you are working on this problem, and I think it's exactly the kind of thing that the federal government ought to be funding by way of research uh, and innovation. Uh, we will, I hope, because we're so smart, and if we marshal the whole economy around this challenge, we will come up with some solutions that we haven't even thought of yet, and your, your very ingenious device might be the one. It might not, but we ought to give things like that a chance, direct air capture might be able to contribute. And so I thank you for that. We will work on providing more grant money and other federal support for that kind of research and innovation. Thank you. Over here. Yeah. Thank you, Congressman Huffman, for being here. Um, I'm very concerned about what's happening in light of our impeachment right now uh -huh. and in light of what is happening to our democracy. Very yeah. concerned. Um, so in light of that, for the 2020 national election, what is being done to protect the vote in terms of voter suppression, in terms of gerrymandering, and potentially in terms of Trump refusing to leave office. Yeah. Well, uh, what is being done to protect the 2020 election? Well, uh, the trial uh, of Donald Trump in the Senate right now is action number one. Uh, it is being driven in large measure because uh, a majority of my colleagues in the House came to believe that it was necessary to take this exceptional step of starting the process of removing a president. And part of that is because he committed what we believe are high crimes and misdemeanors. Um, 
the, 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 act, the misconduct involving Ukraine, trying to use his office to get a foreign government to help him win an election, um, is more brazen than anything we've ever seen a president impeached for in the past. Uh, but it also goes to our ability to have confidence in the next election. If we don't do this, we know that we've got a president who's out there soliciting foreign government interference in the next election, having just benefited from foreign government interference in the 2016 election. In fact, one of the pieces of evidence that you heard in the opening statements was President Trump. He was being interviewed you know, with his helicopter revving up in the background. Right after um, the, the story of his July 25th call with Zelensky came to light, and he was asked, what did you want the Ukrainian government to do? And he basically admitted uh, everything that he's charged with. He said he wanted them to investigate the Bidens, and then he went further and said, China should do it too, in the same breath. So uh, I think that's one of many reasons why I and many of my colleagues feel like we have to do this. Uh, this is not just about what he has done in the past, it's about the impact that it's going to have on our election integrity and, and the sense of fair play going into the 2020 election. So even if the president is not removed, I think we're doing an important service to let him know, to let the whole world know that we're watching, that we're not going to just stand down when he tries to cheat in the next election. Beyond that, on election integrity, uh, H.R. 1, the first big bill that this Congress passed, included a lot of election security um, actions that the Senate has yet to take up. So we've got to put some pressure on Mitch McConnell in that regard. I think there's majority bipartisan support to do those things. They're not particularly controversial, but Mitch McConnell doesn't want to talk about uh, election integrity and election security. Here in California, I think we're, we're pretty secure, uh, in large part because our state government has done a great job of uh, requiring paper ballots and protecting our election systems. I am worried about some other states, though. And I, I can't tell you as we sit here today that, uh, that everything looks, looks good heading into the 2020 election. Okay, right here. Good afternoon. Um, a few weeks ago in Bern, Switzerland, which isn't much bigger than San Rafael, California, over 3,000 people marched in the street to protest the rollout of the small cell towers called 5G cell towers outside their homes. Hundreds of people, thousands of people are already feeling the symptoms and they're feeling sick. This is untested technology. Telecom companies have admitted as such that there's been zero dollars spent on research into the biological effects on humans and wildlife. And hundreds of scientists and doctors around the world have called for a halt to 5G until we can see that it's safe or until it's proven safe. Oregon and New Hampshire have put a commission in place to study the biological effects of this wireless technology on humans and wildlife, like bees. Will you support legislation to make this happen in California too, so that we are not used as guinea pigs? Thank you. Thanks for your question. So here's what I, uh, here's what I have done. There uh, is a, a rulemaking by the FCC that would preempt uh, state and local authority over this issue uh, of siting and rolling out 5G and other technologies. Um, and I happen to believe that the local authorities should have a say uh, in whether this, each community should be able to take a look at this and decide for themselves whether they want it or whether they're worried about potential health effects, et cetera. I'm not an expert on um, the impacts uh, of these uh, technologies, but I do want my local governments to be able to have that authority. So there's a, a bill by my colleague Anna Eshoo that I've co-sponsored that would undo that preemption, give state and local governments the authority to put whatever standards they deem appropriate in place for this issue. Congressman over here. Where am I? There we are. Okay. Hi. Hi there. Um, first of all, thank you so much for being with us. We all really appreciate it. Well, most of us. Um, <laughs> not everyone. <laughs> but my question, it may not be as smooth because I didn't write it down. Uh, it was just right here. Um, my question is, do you have an open communications line with a lot of the county legislators in Marin, Sonoma, so that you can accurately, you know, understand the views of your constituents? 
Um, I try to. You know, I think if I'm if I'm any good at, at being a congressional representative, I need to know my local government partners. That's why we called out several of them who are here today, and it's not just at town halls. I uh, earlier today I was with a, a couple of county supervisors and other county staffers and and uh, city uh, San Rafael city government leaders to talk about homelessness. We had a a round table where we took a real deep dive on what's being done, what's working, what's not, what I can do at the federal level, precisely because we, we need to work together. Uh, and so, you know, I consider myself, uh, you know, a, a part of the team with all of those county and local government officials. We represent the same people, and it's important that we stay in touch and, and work closely together. Mm -hmm. Okay, right here. Uh, hi, my name is Abir from San Anselmo. Uh, I wanted to ask you about something that all of us can influence, which is the Democratic primary. Sorry, I have a, a cold. I wanted to ask you about something that all of us can influence, which is the Democratic primary. <clears throat> and my question is, you know, uh, in theory, we should all vote our conscience and whichever candidate uh, we believe in. There seems to be uh, a push by the Democratic establishment, whether on TV or, or elsewhere, uh, to talk about um, uh, how a kind of dyed in the wool liberal may not do very well in the heartland, and that a centrist, even one who voted for the Iraq war, is somehow going to be more palatable as if that worked in the last election. So my question for you is, um, a lot of us are kind of feeling this, this push and pull at this debate um, uh, in conversations that we're having. How do you think about it, uh, and who are you going to support? Uh, how are you going to vote your conscience? And, and what's your framework for making that decision? Thank well, you. I, I love your question. I'm not ready to make any news here today. Uh, so I have not decided who I'm going to support. But I will say, I mean, it's a great question why because... Not, why, why you I'll tell you why I haven't decided, because I'm, I'm a little terrified, quite frankly. <laughs> uh, I think about the stakes in this election. This is not just another election, folks. This is not an election where we have policy differences on which you know reasonable people can debate and differ. This is like heart and soul of this country and whether we're gonna have a democracy uh, going forward. So um, it is not a good time for infighting. It's really not. And uh, that's why I have kind of stood down. Uh, my natural instinct would be to just follow my heart after whoever I liked and go all in and see where it goes. Uh, I've been a little more cautious this time around. Uh, and especially with this dynamic Democratic primary, I'm not sure where it goes. Uh, but I guess I would just say this. I would caution against all of this amateur punditry that tells people, oh, you know, ignore your own uh, instinct and your gut and your heart and, you know, try to be a pundit. That's not how anyone should really vote. Uh, so I, I don't buy that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, on the more progressive side, I don't like sort of the preemptive character assassination of others in the field who might not be as progressively pure. Uh, we're going to have to win this election, folks. And uh, so let's... Uh, Pick whoever you feel is the best. Let's see where it goes, and then let's all get unified and get behind whoever that is, because we got a country to save, right? Thank you, right here. Hi, my name is Kathy, and I'm a veteran, too, and I'm a little bit nervous. Oh, you're doing great. Uh, um, I live in Novato, and I belong to two of the veteran groups here. I belong to... Uh, the, um, we don't have a name. We don't have a name. The No Name Veterans Group? The, the <laughs> Vietnam Veterans of America, right. and I got a lot of my brothers here yep. with me tonight. And, um, and Veterans Cannabis Group that started uh -huh. here in Marin County. All right. And Aaron, um, my, our boss isn't here. He's in Mexico. He called me today. And, and Aaron Augustus. I'll repeat it. Aaron Augustus, he's our boss, and he's okay. in Mexico. He called us here to me today. Anyway, my question is, I have a traumatic brain injury, and I have what they call PTSD, but I don't have PTSD because D is a disorder, and I don't have a disorder. And right. um, I want to know about if, if they're ever going to um, let the veterans get cannabis at the yeah. VA because we have 22 veterans commit suicide a day, yeah. and they give us 
every kind of narcotic there is. They yeah. give us morphine patches, they give us Vicodin, and they just load us up on everything there is. And we have veterans groups clear across the nation that say that we would like cannabis, that it helps us with our pain, that it helps us with yeah. our PTS. Yeah. <laughs> and we, and uh, we would like the, the VA to give us cannabis. It's too expensive for us. California, yep. you tax us too high. We have to go underground to get a lot that. of us. Yeah. Help us yeah. out here. OK. I agree with you. Yeah. Let, let me just say that I, I agree. Um, I, you may know I have supported decriminalization, the end of marijuana prohibition. I think we can better regulate it like we do alcohol and tobacco. Uh, and especially some of these more promising medical uses of, of cannabis, the idea that that would be off limits to veterans when we have an opioid epidem epidemic uh, is crazy. If you can help manage pain with something like cannabis, we should be making that available to veterans. We've just got some federal policy that has to catch up, and we're making progress. So, uh, you know, a majority of Americans now live in states where cannabis is legal, uh, either medically or recreationally for adults, and uh, more are coming online all the time. At the, at the federal level, we're not quite there in terms of descheduling uh, marijuana, which is really what we need to do to just get the federal government out of the way. But we took an important step this year uh, by doing something called the SAFE Act, which allows uh, in states where it is legal, like California, and you've got all these folks trying to get right with the law, trying to come out of the underground economy and follow these high standards, uh, but they can't access the banking state uh, system. So they've got to launder money. They've got to kind of have one foot in the underground economy and one foot out. That doesn't work at all. And so we passed a really important bipartisan reform to allow access to the banking system. We got to go several more steps to, uh, to get this right, but we're making progress and we got to get that available to veterans as soon as possible. Okay, over here. Mm -hmm. Hello, Congressman. My name is Richard, and uh, thank you. I'm over here on the wall. Thank you, Richard. Um, and thank you for today to, for hosting us. And I'm glad you were able to get out to Point Reyes recently. Mm -hmm. uh, I am blessed to call Inverness home. And Beautiful. I'm, and I'm able to visit Point, you know, the, the seashore often. And I drive around, and I've been picking up trash on the beaches for the past decade. And I've destroyed two Priuses on the roads that you probably experienced out there. And I'm, it's my understanding. Pierce Point Road was, I mean, I'm amazed I still have a suspension after go, last weekend. Go yeah. to the White House and you yeah. won't have a suspension yeah. because yeah. there's a section of road that, you know, it probably looks like, you know, Iraq or Afghanistan. Yeah. And it's my understanding that the holdup, that road was supposed to be repaired two years ago and there's something called a flat tax. That, so there's a... There's a, there's a grant disparity. Yeah. The feds flap say fix it P for this. The flap. And the locals bid it for five times this, and it never happens. And so yeah. what can you do to help us get these roads fixed? Those roads get 20-ton milk trucks driving on, out to all those dairies to service those cows out there <laughs> multiple times a day. Yep. Um, what, can you help us fix those roads? Yeah, we have to, we have to get those roads fixed. So uh, thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, it's, a, it's a federal public lands transportation program that you're referring to, FLAP program. And uh, they don't provide nearly enough funding to reflect the real cost of road construction in a place like Northern California. So just that one stretch of road out to the lighthouse, uh, which I think the RFP came in at like $35 million, something that you know is just hard to imagine, that'll consume our entire region's budget for federal public land road repair for the next several years. And we'll have a hard time getting to all of these others. So we got to do several things. First. I've got to make sure, as a member of the Transportation Committee, that we include our national parks and public lands and the infrastructure in those, those public lands uh, in any road and bridge uh, package that comes out of the Congress. And, I, and I'm hopeful that we'll do that. But second, we'll, we'll probably need to look at the way these uh, RFPs are issued, because uh, these bids are coming in way too high. Uh, and so we're kind of working at the staff level on that as well. So stay tuned. I don't have a great answer for you right now, but I'm very well aware of the problem, and I know that we've got to do a better job of getting those roads fixed. Congressman in the back. Yeah. Okay. Congressman over here. Hello, Congress. 
Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Congressman, first for participating in our blessed, messy democracy and taking our questions directly. You bet. You bet. Thank you. Worst form of government in the world except for all the others, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so with that in mind, bear with me, because I know I represent probably 30 people in the audience. So we're going to take another stab at this, please. Okay. Politely, of course, and respectfully. Uh, I spoke with Kenneth Brower, who's in his 70s. He's the son of David Brower, former president, as you know, of the Sierra Club. And I sat and asked him many pointed questions, including were the founders of he was, uh, his father sat with Kennedy in 1962 before you were born, mm -hmm. just when I was born, and indeed, the original intent was not to have cattle remain in our national park. So my question to you is again, why do you support their yeah. continued existence okay. in the, no, let me finish please. Yeah. It's also very important because also, since I know you believe in climate change, thank goodness, they are the number one source of air pollution, water pollution, and ocean pollution in, and biodiversity loss in our own state park. That's why we're so passionate about it, especially because we believe we can, we can reach you, or at yeah. least reach other people to be educated about this issue. It's not just shooting elk, although that's horrible, but cattle really, if you want to keep them in Marin, West Marin, and dairy and ranching, that's one, that's one matter. But inside a national park, in fact, at low, uh, lower rates, they're being subsidized by taxpayers. So it's just an absurd situation yeah. and a polluting situation. I, I appreciate the chance to try to speak a little more to this. So uh, first of all, look, I, I, uh, I, I know your intentions are good. I know you're concerned about our environment and our public lands. We, we share that concern. But let me, let me try to directly answer the direct parts of, of your question. Uh, I will tell you that there is quite a debate about this proposition that Congress or President Kennedy or anyone else intended for these ranches to go away after a specific period of time. People have done doctoral dissertations on this. I have gone back and read the relevant congressional history. It's, it's just nowhere close to that clear. In fact, there's an awful lot of stuff that would point in the other direction. So we, we really just have to, there is a common set of actual facts here that we should be able to accept while we debate the policy. Uh, and, and I really want to bring us back to that. Yeah, it would, look, we got to be respectful too and just not shout each other down, please. Um, now, uh, in terms of, I, I talked about the uniqueness of this park. Part of this park is about historic preservation, all right? And that's right there in the mission of the park. Uh, these ranches were recently uh, nationally designated as a historic district, which is one of a whole bunch of indications that telling that story of the history of the Point Reyes National Seashore includes the working landscapes that these multi-generational ranches represent. Okay, this is not, I believe it's unfair to characterize them as industrial agricultural polluters. I know these families, uh, it's just not fair, it's not accurate. There's about two dozen of these small family ranching um, activities out there. There is twice as much land in wilderness as there is in the pastoral area that's doing this historic ranching. So a little bit of perspective, a little bit of context. And I think the contribution to local food systems is significant as well. If you talk to anyone in the agricultural community of West Marin, they're very concerned about what happens if you lose those organic, most, almost all organic ranches and dairies. There's a tipping point at which the economy of scale that all of them need to continue to provide us with a local food system collapses. They're very worried about that. And I think local food matters and can be part of our climate strategy as well. If we just say we don't like cows because they're, they're emitters, so we're gonna pick on these two dozen historic ranches, we're gonna drive them out of existence, I don't know anybody in this room that's going to stop eating beef or dairy products. Probably what happens, you're probably already not eating them, my friend, okay? Uh, if you're a vegan and you've done that, hats off to you. That's great. But I don't think we should pat ourselves on the back and claim that we've uh, implemented a climate solution if you simply drive that demand off to CAFOs in Kern County, which really are industrial polluters, okay? So, um, it's... Uh, it's a, it's a good conversation. It is intended, you know, in a good-hearted way. I thank you for that. Uh, but let me just close by saying, 
I'm not going to decide this issue, folks. So you can come and holler at me at my town halls if you want. The Park Service is going to decide this. There's been a very transparent public process. I'm pretty sure all of you have engaged in that and, and uh, have made your views known. They will now take that input and come up with a preferred alternative. Some of you will probably sue to challenge it in court, and on we go. But uh, this won't be my decision about how to strike the balance between continuing these family ranches and dairies and celebrating our thriving elk herds. Okay, thanks. Okay, right here. Hi, my name is John Reynolds, and uh, I uh, actually, coincidentally, we, uh, my friend Leland over here and, and Ernie, uh, we served contemporaneously in, in Vietnam. I was a combat soldier, and uh, Ernie, uh, Leland and I got there on the exact same day, as it turns out, and, uh, or rather, we were drafted on the same day. We got there very, very close together. But uh, one of the things that, so I, I have, I'm invested in this whole business of not taking, you know, lightly a decision to go to war. Uh, I noticed that uh, the big messes we've gotten into have been really at, at the hands of those who have never experienced combat. Or, or, or the military, for that matter. So, but that's not really my my uh, my issue. I have a real concern, and I wonder how, to what extent you you share it. That a lot of division and and the fracturing and the polarization in our country today, and the concentration of wealth and power, yeah. is to a large extent facilitated or enabled by social media that has run amok. And for, for which it, it, it is a platform for people who would manipulate and subvert yeah. our access to the truth. Yeah. It concerns the heck out of me. And I wonder, are we losing a grip on our democracy mm -hmm. because of you know, that and other, other forces yeah. that are not being, you know, uh, being uh, uh, responsibly curated? Oh, right. That's a well, well framed question. Um, let me thank you for your service as well. Uh, and before I speak to that, uh, let me say that I see County Supervisor Dennis Redoni in the back of the room. So I did not mean to skip you at the beginning, Dennis. We're glad to have you here. Dennis also gets to represent the West Marin community and have this fun conversation that, that we're having here today. Um, so I have struggled with this issue of our social media platforms. Uh, and, and I think you can see that we're beginning to have a real national conversation about it for the first time. I mean, in, in some ways, social media has been this wonderful democratizing tool, right? I mean, it kind of brought us the Arab Spring and all sorts of other things that, that looked like a counterweight to political power. Uh, but we saw in the 2016 election that it could be easily manipulated and corrupted and uh, the, the real um, challenge from a policy perspective, I think, is whether you treat the Facebooks and the Twitters of the world as just pass-throughs of free speech, uh, in which case you know, they carry with them all the free speech protection of the people who use their platform, and it's very tough to do anything to regulate them, uh, or whether you treat them as publishers and hold them to some standards uh, of accuracy and responsibility. And, and I fall into the latter camp. Uh, I mean, I, I do realize there's a lot of individualized free speech going on through those platforms, but they've got algorithms at work that are deciding a lot of what we see that are causing things to go viral and other things not. Um, they've got business plans where they are profiting on certain types of responses. So this is not just an honest pass through of free speech. And it's obviously something that we're learning uh, has the power to do a lot of damage to our democracy if it's abused. I, I don't have a specific answer for what we've got to do about it, but I think for the first time at least we're having hearings. Mark Zuckerberg doesn't like it, but uh, we are, uh, we're going to keep, I think, calling him uh, back to Congress. We're going to keep thinking of ways that we can put some rules in play and some regulations, frankly, something we haven't wanted to do very often on the internet, but uh, it, it's time. We, we have to have some rules of the road. In the back. Congressman, in the back. In the back. Back, back, back. There we are. Thank you. Good afternoon, Congressman. I'm Martha Turi from Fairfax. Hello, Martha. Thank you very much for being here. 
Thank you very much for being here. I appreciate it. We, I think we all do. Um, I want to say that I am terribly concerned that the Republican Party in the Senate is busy destroying the rule of law. I would like to have you thank Congressman Schiff. There is a star in his crown. But I personally greatly fear what comes after this sham trial. I fear that the Republican Party and whoever are paying them will do everything in their power to continue to destroy the rule of law, the land, the water, the environment, and civil liberties and civil rights before November of this year. And I would like to know what, if anything, we can do. Yeah. Well, that's a, uh, Martha, thank you. That's a pretty bleak uh, assessment of where we are, but I gotta say a lot of it is well-founded. I share many of those concerns, uh, especially about the fragile state of the rule of law, which is not something I ever thought I'd have to worry about in this country. Um, the rule of law is very much, I think, hanging in the balance with this issue of presidential accountability. I don't know that we lose it just because this trial doesn't go our way in the Senate if it doesn't, uh, but certainly the idea of, um, of Trump continuing to, um, to be unrestricted in his abuses and maybe even cheating in the 2020 election and getting four more years if that's what happens. I, I think with, uh, with Barr as the Attorney General, all bets are off and I'm deeply concerned about it. So look, you asked what you can do. I think you all know what you can do, right? Uh, we gotta go out if you care about these things and win some elections. Okay, over here in the back. Uh, Congressman Huffman, thanks again for including us here in your decision-making process and being so articulate about the issues and being a good listener to everyone here. I really appreciate you challenged my cynicism about politicians pretty <laughs> sharply, you. so thank you. Thank you. Um, just two things. One is just a clarification about one element that I haven't heard be spoken of here regarding Point Reyes. Okay. The Agricultural Land Trust was innovated, and that innovation allowed those ranchers, those, those heritage ranchers and ranches to be assimilated into a national park system. And that model was exported around the country, and we now have 700 um, land trusts as a, as a consequence of that, and the model is, has been exported around the world. And so this is, you know, if, if it had not been innovated, we wouldn't have a national, um, uh, Point Reyes National Seashore, for starters. We wouldn't have hundreds of land trusts around the country or around the world. So I just wanted to bring that in as kind of, let's take the broad view here, um, you know, so that's, I think that's really important. The other question, the question that I had was, um, there is pervasive corruption in our government, in business, even we even see it in law enforcement, it's pervasive around our country. And I'm going to guess that in your responsible and many years of tenure and your position as a public servant, um, and I'm asking this question in the spirit of, of requesting your mentorship and empowerment of your constituency, that you've encountered at least some invitation to participate in corruption <laughs> at some point. And my question is, how did, how did you, um, should that have happened, how did you respond to that, and what did you learn from it that you have taken into your, um, your values and how you conduct yourself in your, your dealings in your position in protecting our democracy? Well, well thank you. I've, uh, I've never been asked that question in a town hall. Uh, to sort of share my brush with uh, an invitation to be corrupt. Um, but l let me start by agreeing with you that I think our rich history of land conservation is something we can all be proud of here in Marin County. Marin Agricultural Land Trust is, is a great part of that history. And uh, we, we really have led uh, the rest of the states and the nation uh, in that regard. So let's, let's be proud of that. Um, 
you know, I, I can't think of any specific thing, but I, I will just say this. Uh, when you become a legislator and you have to get on that treadmill of fundraising, which is kind of part of, of being in politics and running for office, um, you have to decide pretty early on uh, whether you're going to allow that to influence the policy work and the actions that you take uh, as a servant of the people. And if you don't draw a very bright line, I think you're going to be in trouble for day one. Now, I, I'm really lucky. Uh, I get to represent people who support me pretty generously, have in many cases for a whole bunch of years. I could look around this room and thank you, everybody, because I got a lot of supporters in here. Uh, but they don't ask me for anything. Uh, for the most part, I think they see it the way I would want them to see it as an investment in good government, even if they don't agree with me on, on everything that I do. Um, I've got other colleagues who uh, have, I guess, had to make some Faustian deals in order to continue on that fundraising treadmill. Uh, I, I will share with you, I had one individual uh, back in, in 2016, I won't get too specific, but tell me that uh, he had just come into a bunch of money. Uh, because a, a parent had died and he wanted to start sending max contributions to politicians uh, as the way to spend his inheritance, uh, and that if I would only endorse his chosen presidential candidate, he would send me a max contribution. He sent this in an email. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I wrote him back and, and uh, explained to him that that would be a felony uh, and that I... Uh, I really encourage him to stop talking that way. And, and I just think uh, every public official has got to be sensitive to this linkage of the, the fundraising that unfortunately we all have to do some of, uh, and then the decisions we make and the, and the official actions we take. In the back, Congressman. Oh. Hi, my name is Dave. Thanks for being here. I want to ask you a transportation question, okay. the worsening traffic on 101. And rush hour is basically six hours a day here now. Yeah. I don't see any construction in the past decades on 101 in Marin, adding more lanes. And there's other issues, like there's still no bypass, there's, there's no road 101 north to, to 580 east without a traffic light. Yeah. Um, our carpool lanes in Marin don't start till 4.30 going north, which is an hour and a half long later than all the other counties in the Bay Area. Um, our freeways still, because of rising sea level, Lucky Drive floods and several other yeah. Yeah. roads flood, and they're not doing any work on 101 in Marin. Get ready for Highway 37. Yeah. And Highway 37, but I didn't know if that was a federal highway, so I wasn't going to ask not, you. But yeah. So what are your plans for that on the Transportation yeah. Committee? Are we getting funds, and are the highways going to be improved? Okay, so uh, my job in response to this challenge is, is not to dictate you know, how you add lanes here or fix the 580 interchange dysfunction, which is a huge part of it in Marin County. Uh, my job is largely to send money uh, so that the California Transportation Commission and the local transportation authorities can prioritize what they want to do and compete for that money. Um, our problem is we uh, largely fund transportation infrastructure at the federal level uh, from a gas tax that hasn't been raised since 1993. Okay, so what I, what I often tell my colleagues in Congress, how would you like to run your next campaign on 1993 dollars? You know, that, that just doesn't work very well. Meanwhile, we've got a lot more need, uh, and it's, it's also public transit systems. It's not just uh, roads and bridges. So the first thing I've got to do is address this failure to keep up with uh, the revenue needs of transportation. We're going to have to have some tax mechanism. I will support anything that we can get a majority vote to pass. It could be an increase of the gas tax. That's not a great long-term solution because we're going to use less gas in the future, I hope. Uh, it's going to be a declining revenue stream. So uh, I'll also support uh, a VMT, vehicle miles traveled mechanism, if we can, especially if we can think of one that's fair to rural communities. I represent a lot of rural communities, so we've got to have uh, a way to address that. Uh, I'm really interested in a life cycle carbon fee that would apply to all transportation fuels, including electricity, uh, and replace the gas tax eventually. Uh, so I've put forward legislation to do that. Uh, but any of it, uh, all of it, needs to happen. I've got to send that federal money back, and then we've got to look to our state and local transportation leaders to, to prioritize and move these projects forward. Okay, right here. Mm -hmm. 
Hi, um, my name is Cheryl. I was born and raised in San Francisco Bay Area, and I love wildlife. I love the outdoors. I love our national parks. Um, we are so lucky to have Point Reyes National Seashore so close, GGNRA, uh, so close that we could get there in an hour. Um, I was really dismayed to see um, how the seashore has degraded with the cattle on the land. Um, I didn't realize there were 5,000 cattle and only 600 um, tule elk. Um, you want to ask me something that hasn't been asked about that? I'm happy to speak to it, yeah, but we probably I, shouldn't keep having the same conversation over uh, and over. I haven't said anything exactly what everybody else says. I, okay. I think we're having a discussion about this, if that's OK with you. No, please. Plus, I still please. am within I'm, my minute. Yeah. Um, but I hear you. You're not the National Park Service. Mm -hmm. You, the National Park Service, is going to do what they want to do. But we're assuming you have some impact. Um, this community has elected you to try to represent mm -hmm. us. Um, apparently, the National Park Service did do a survey asking us what we wanted, and we said we wanted to preserve wildlife and the land. Okay. And um, there's also not been an environmental impact study of how those cattle are degrading the land. Um, why is not that not being taken into account? Um, apparently, the levels of E. coli have gone up in the water from pollution from the cattle. And if the cattle need to remain there for historic okay. reasons, why can't they be scaled can I, back? Can I, uh, why are the tule elk targeted so the, for being the killed? Part of your, the part of your comment that I don't think I've spoken to yet that I'll ha happily address is the, the environmental study uh, on impacts. Uh, now, there is a comprehensive environmental review process the Park Service is in the middle of. It will look at some of these things, but the reason they're not starting over, uh, like from a baseline of no action versus cattle, is we've had cattle for like coming up on 200 years. So this is not a new federal action or a federal program, and that's just the way environmental laws work. Uh, so you won't see that sort of nothing versus the status quo, uh, I, I don't think, uh, in this review. And, and let me just clarify, whatever differences we might have on some people wanting to get the ranchers out of the park, me wanting to give them a longer term permit. I want to be clear, uh, nobody gets a shortcut on the environment. I want to hold all of them I I as they continue their operations to very, very high environmental standards. So I, I probably should have clarified that earlier. No shortcuts under any environmental law, no lowering of our environmental standards. We need to maintain really high standards. Congressman, in the back. Mm -hmm. In the back. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to say, I feel that if we had a real democracy in this country, we'd be talking about President Clinton and not President Trump. I just want to know, what are you doing about the Electoral College? What's happening in Washington to eliminate what I feel is a really undemocratic process? Yeah, thank you for the question. You know, I, I get this Electoral College question everywhere I go, uh, and it's a good question. Um, obviously, the Electoral College is this anachronism that uh, was created a long time ago in a country that was very different for reasons that are very different. It, it is one of those mechanisms in our Constitution that is actually counter-democratic as opposed to democratic. Uh, and it's there for some interesting historic reasons. But uh, the, the bottom line on this question, as much as it frustrates us because California would like to see a national popular vote, our, vo our state votes with the national popular vote, so it feels very unfair and unjust when uh, a minority of states and a minority of the national uh, community can pick the winner in a presidential race. Uh, those are probably going to be the rules, as much as we don't like them for the foreseeable future, because you need a constitutional amendment to change it. Now, there, there are, there's a workaround that some people are advocating, and I've actually supported it, where states would pledge their electors to follow the national popular vote. And the state of California has done that. And if you get to 270 states that are part of that compact, it can behave like a national popular vote it, using the Electoral College mechanism. Here's the problem with that. That works great as long as your state is in sync with the national popular vote. But imagine once uh, the California votes one way and the rest of the country votes another, how are you going to feel? Uh, and our electors are pledged opposite of how we vote, we're going to want out of that deal right away, and it is going to crumble. So it's not a durable, long-term fix 
to this problem. The only real durable ultimate fix is a constitutional amendment. And we just got to be honest, right now the politics aren't there to amend the Constitution and change it. We're just going to have to go forward with these rotten rules and win elections anyway. Okay, right here, and we're down to our last question, Congressman. Okay. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Jan Lotion. I've grown up in the Bay Area. I was not looking forward to listening to the impeachment trial because I, at this point, every time one of these Republicans opens their mouth, I feel sick to my stomach and get very depressed and very angry. But what I've experienced so far has made me feel differently. I feel profound gratitude for all of the Democrats that are working that hard to keep democracy alive. Thank you. I've been yeah. very... <laughs> There's a dog that started barking back there when you said that, so we all agree with you. And yeah. <laughs> I, I've been particularly moved by Adam Schiff. Yeah, he's great. He's just amazing. <laughs> and I think we all have to remember just how hard all of these people are working yeah. for us and to kind of keep the faith that there yeah. are good people in our country who good. care about democracy. And then since I, am I at the end here? Okay. You're the cleanup hitter. I yeah. have been telling people who, you know, like to complain about how awful things are and like to wring their hands but aren't doing a damn thing and that it's all sort of like hopeless. And I, my new motto is, I'd rather be an optimist that we are gonna win and be proven wrong than be a pessimist and be confirmed. Mm, I like it, I like it, yeah. So well, thank I, you. I do think that if we all really pledge that we're gonna do something, whether it's postcarding or driving to Tracy or flying to Arizona or donating money to Amy, um, McGrath, that if we all do something, it's going to add up, just like it did in 2018. That didn't happen by magic. It was all these groups from Indivisible and Swing Left and all these thousands upon thousands of people were out there doing it. We can do it again. Well, thank you for that. That's a... I think uh, ending on that note, the, a call to active citizenship is a great way to wrap up a conversation that is really what our democracy is all about, a chance for me as your member of Congress to visit with my constituents and, and just have a great, far-ranging, civil, respectful conversation. This is, a, this is good politics here. Uh, let me also thank you for calling out my colleague Adam Schiff and our Democratic House managers. Um, I have, uh, in, in a prior life, I did some work as a trial lawyer. I know how hard you work to prepare for that day of trial and that opening statement. And these folks did three consecutive days of opening statements, which, which were effectively kind of the trial. I mean, hopefully we'll get witnesses and documents, but uh, they, were the, they were the main part probably of what this trial will be. And it's, it was clear that they just put an enormous amount of work into this. Uh, they put their heart and soul on the line. And I think that that uh, passion and that authenticity really came through, hopefully for the American people, maybe even for some of those cold, shriveled hearts in the, in the Republican Senate. You never know. Uh, so look, uh, I will just close by saying for everybody that finds themselves you know, subject to uh, bouts of despair, you know, these, are, these are tough times. I ride that roller coaster right there along with you. Um, despair is just not very effective. It doesn't get much done. Uh, and I think a better approach is to draw that inspiration wherever we can find it. I hope Adam Schiff inspired all of you. He certainly did me. You guys inspire me to keep going, and maybe some of my efforts will um, bounce back uh, by way of inspiration to you. But we can create our own hope, and I think we can make a difference as active citizens. It's been great talking with you today. Hey, Rita. How are you?